Rediscovering the Importance of Lifestyle In the world of traditional Western medicine, the idea of lifestyle medicine is quite recent. In fact, the medical institutions in Western countries only began taking this very seriously starting in the 1930s, but in a very substantial way starting in the 1960s. Prior to those points in time, the whole idea of changing your lifestyle to improve your health outcomes was considered quaint or even superstitious. By and large, Western doctors focused on chemicals and surgery to get people better. Thankfully, we have overcome such thinking because, as it turns out, lifestyle provides input to the human body on so many levels. These inputs are not inconsequential. They really go a long way in making you who you are. Accordingly, if there are any problems with these inputs, you are sure to feel the consequences. This sea of change in the rank-and-file doctor's impression of lifestyle's impact on overall health signals a matching change in medical professionals' view of the body and mind connection. Starting in the 1930s and coming to a head in the 1960s and following decades, the previously thought of iron wall between body and mind started to crumble. Lifestyle is a summation of that because your lifestyle provides inputs on different levels. It provides a nutritional input, and a social input. Your work conditions have a very significant impact on your well-being. Stress can either push you forward or drag you down. This applies across the board. Your ability to mentally focus is part of the equation. Believe it or not, your financial state plays a big role as well. Finally, tying all of this together is your spiritual aspiration. You may not be a particularly religious person, but everybody has a spiritual component regardless of whether we wish to recognize it or not. All of these inputs work together. They flow through each other, and they impact each other in a very significant way. The big problem here is the fact that human beings are actually being pushed from different angles. All of these are inputs. What you choose to eat in any given day has a tremendous effect on your overall well-being. Take the case of magnesium. Do you feel irritable? Do you feel sad for no reason? Do you often get out of bed in a bad mood? Does it seem like things don't quite work out for you, or at least you feel like things aren't panning out? Well, you might want to consider the amount of magnesium in your diet. Fairly recent nutritional studies show that deficiencies in magnesium, which a lot of people suffer from, impact a range of mental, emotional, and physical states. The same applies to vitamin D. A lot of people are thinking that vitamin D is a no-brainer. After all, most people have access to sunlight. Well, you have to expose yourself consciously to sunlight at a certain time range. You can't just go out at any time and expect your vitamin D levels to be optimal. You actually have to be purposeful in calculating your exposure to sunlight. Otherwise, your body is not going to synthesize optimal levels of vitamin D. According to fairly recent research on this amazing vitamin, vitamin D actually has a wider impact than bone health. It impacts psychological states, moods. In fact, we're still learning the wide range of benefits people get from vitamin D. Your overall lifestyle determines whether you ingest enough magnesium or you get enough sunlight to enjoy optimal levels of vitamin D. Sadly, a lot of people are experiencing symptoms of deficiencies in these and other vitamins and nutrients, and they have absolutely no clue. They just feel that they are anxious. They can't sleep well. They have mood imbalances. Automatically, they think that they need chemicals like antidepressants or anti-anxiety medication. It is no surprise that Americans are over-medicated. It's like trying to kill ants by burning down your house. I would think that you know that doesn't make any sense. However, this is precisely the problem that we have when we do not completely realize how important lifestyle choices are. Social input. Similarly, you need social input. Did you know that when you connect with people by simply exchanging small talk and generally hanging out and being comfortable, certain chemicals are released through your system? This calms you down. In fact, in a very interesting study of people from a town in Italy called Rosetto in Foggia province, scientists concluded that even if people were to eat the same high-fat, high-cholesterol diet just like the modern American diet, they can still have great life outcomes. The secret? Social connection. That's right, your social inputs can stabilize what would otherwise be negative lifestyle inputs. There's quite a bit of scientific research out there saying that if you eat a high-carb, high-fat, high-cholesterol diet, Chances are your life expectancy is not going to be all that good. At the very least, you're going to run into serious health problems as you get older. Well, it turned out that people from the town of Rosetto did not suffer from these problems despite the fact that they enjoyed the typical modern American diet. They eat a lot of cream, fat, you name it. The secret, however, is that people who come from this town hang out and socialize. This social input goes a long way in stabilizing the system. And I'm not just talking about the physical effects of socialization. When you socialize, there's a tremendous emotional effect as well. It's very hard to be lonely. It's very hard to feel so disconnected that you want to kill yourself. 
That usually doesn't happen when you're in a social environment where people genuinely care about you. When you don't show up, people ask where you've been. People look after you. People are curious what you're up to. In primate societies, social cohesion is maintained when chips and monkeys groom each other. Well, we no longer do that on a large scale, but we have a substitute. We talk to each other. It doesn't have to be big. You don't have to talk about the heavy, substantive issues of life. Even small talk is enough. Even smiling at each other produces a biochemical response that tends to stabilize mood. Never underestimate the power of social input when it comes to your general physical health. Work conditions. In the West, there is an ongoing obesity epidemic primarily because in the past 30 years, people are no longer walking around. In the span of a typical eight-hour workday, people are not normally spending a significant amount of time standing up or moving about. Instead, most people sit down on a chair and look at a screen. While this has increased work productivity due to software automation and computing power, societies have paid a pretty steep price. A sedentary lifestyle has a serious effect on your body's ability to heal itself and maintain proper balance. Not surprisingly, recent research studies indicate that failing to stand up for long enough periods of time can actually lead to long-term, serious health risks. A lot of people got alarmed by those research papers for a good reason because, by and large, people are sitting down for work. This has led to a movement in many workplaces throughout Western Europe and the United States and other places where office workers can choose to stand up while using a computer. These are called standing desks. These are definitely steps in the right direction because your work conditions do play a very big role in your physical wellness. In terms of your emotional health, being put in charge of a project or being responsible for something with a higher level of accountability does wonders for your psychological and emotional state. When people work at jobs where there's absolutely no accountability, they eventually feel like they really don't matter all that much. At some point in time, they feel that the stuff they do doesn't really count. And it's not a surprise that people in such environments tend to be more susceptible to negative behaviors like alcoholism, drug addiction, overeating, smoking, and other negative behaviors. Stress Inputs For the longest time, the conventional wisdom about stress is that it is bad across the board. Whenever the word stress comes up, people always assume the worst. Well, it turns out, according to a fairly recent analysis, that there is good stress and bad stress. Good stress enables you to face your limits and overcome them. In other words, you are challenged enough to the point where you are given the opportunity to step up and push the boundaries of your comfort zone. You become a more competent and confident person. This is good stress. On the other hand, there is stress that grinds you down. This often involves timelines, delivery dates, and group projects. You feel less and less competent and you are more likely to blame other people for your failings or run away from responsibility altogether by hiding in the crowd. In other words, you let other people essentially take the heat for the work you should have been doing. As you can well imagine, this is negative across the board. It doesn't make you look like a hero in front of other people, and you are not challenging yourself. You're not putting your skills to good use so they start to deteriorate. You become less and less effective. The worst part to all of this is that your stress avoidance at work makes you even more mentally unprepared to handle stress. Your tolerance for it deteriorates over time the more successful you are in avoiding it. Again, there is such a thing as healthy stress. It enables you to toughen up and step up to take greater and greater levels of responsibility, not just at work, but you take responsibility for your life in general. Mental focus. What you choose to focus on plays a big role in your lifestyle's inputs. If you keep dwelling on the past, don't be surprised if two things happen. You don't enjoy your victories now or you get upset because of past perceived harm. Neither of these are good. The problem with the past is that most people use it the wrong way. There's really only one good reason you should think about the past. You need to use it as a map for the future. Other than that, you end up dragging yourself down and holding yourself back the more you think about things that have already happened. I don't know about you, but I don't have access to that amazing high-tech DeLorean sports car time machine from the movie Back to the Future. That's really the only way you can change the past. Facts already happened. Things already took place. The genie is out of the bottle. There's no way you can put it back in. Unfortunately, a lot of people keep obsessing about the past with the unstated assumption that the more they think about what happened, that somehow, some way, it will change their present reality. It doesn't work that way. If anything, it just depresses you, makes you mad, makes you feel that things are unfair, and prevents you from seeing the big picture. You have to understand that even though bad things may have happened to you in the past, you are still responsible for your response to these memories. Are you going to allow them to hold you back? Are you going to allow them to set up impossible standards that get in the way of your present happiness? It's really hard to prepare for the future 
when all you can do is look at the past and how you have been hurt, mistreated, humiliated, embarrassed, or diminished. Stop beating yourself up. Unfortunately, this easily becomes a mental habit. People keep reliving their negative memories because there's some sort of reward for them. Let's be honest. You may be thinking to yourself, I got abused in the past. I had really bad stuff done to me. What kind of reward can I possibly get from that? Well, if anything, it gives you someone or something to blame. That's a reward. Think about it. If you think that other people caused your present difficulties or your present inability to move on or change for the better, you're shifting the responsibility to them. When you blame other people, you no longer own this responsibility to change. After all, in your mind, they cause the problem. However, you pay a big price because when you say that somebody caused the problem in your life, you're also logically telling yourself that they have the solution. Do you see why this is a problem? It's bad enough trying to change yourself. Can you imagine trying to change their mind? Also, if the past abuse or harm was done by somebody who has moved on, how are you going to get a hold of them? It would be physically impossible. Moreover, even if you were able to track them down, it's anybody's guess whether they would really want to help you. They've moved on with their lives. Do you see what's wrong with this problem? Do you see what's wrong with this mental solution? You have given them the ability to fix your problems. When you blame others, you have given them the ability to fix your problems. You've handed them control. Refusing to blame and taking responsibility for whatever is wrong or frustrating with your life in the here and now is one of the most powerful acts you can ever take because you are retaking control. You are saying, the past may not have been my fault. My present is my responsibility. I choose to change what I focus on. I choose to take action on these negative feelings that I have from the past. Please understand that mental focus, whether it takes the form in past issues or worries about the future, tends to get worse over time. Why? What you dwell on grows. So, be very careful about what you constantly think about. Pay attention to your mental patterns because these have emotional, psychological, physical, and other inputs. Financial input. Stressing out about money impacts your self-confidence, which, in turn, impacts your competence and, eventually, your self-esteem. People who stress out about the fact that they do not have money often reduce themselves based on their current financial state. Have you ever said to yourself when you're looking at a nice-looking car or a great-looking gadget at a store somewhere that you do not have the money? Have you ever seen a friend's Facebook timeline update and said to yourself, well, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, or something similar? When you say these things to yourself, you are responding to the financial inputs in your life. In particular, you are voicing out your attitude regarding these financial inputs. When you say, I do not have money, that's a statement of fact. You're basically programming yourself to believe that you not only do not have the cash, but you are incapable of coming up with it. It is no surprise that people who keep saying that tend to erode their self-esteem. They tend to deplete their personal ability to change their financial reality. How can they? They just say flat out, I cannot afford it. That's just not going to happen. You can start changing your financial inputs by doing one or more of the following. First, you can start mentally reprogramming yourself. Instead of automatically saying, I do not have the money or the rich get richer, say to yourself, how can I find the money? You can also say, what do I need to do to afford that? When you phrase the statement in the form of a question, you are giving yourself a homework assignment. You are putting yourself in a position to engage your creative and imaginative side. Obviously, you do not have the money now, but by phrasing things in a question, this becomes some sort of big, fun puzzle instead of some damning judgment on yourself. When you constantly say to yourself, how can I find the money? You start jogging your creative faculties to zero in on an alternative reality. The alternative reality, of course, is you driving around in a Ferrari or living in a big mansion. The more you focus on it, the more the answers start to appear. This may mean that you'd have to take a second job. This may mean that you would have to reduce your expenses. This may mean that you would have to retool your skill set. Whatever the case may be, they lead to action, which then begs the question of commitment. When you start making these changes in some aspects of your life, they affect other areas of your life as well, and you become a different person. It all begins with choosing to reprogram yourself based on how you look at money. Make no mistake about it, your attitude towards money speaks volumes regarding your attitudes towards yourself, what you're capable of, and what you're about. People who are very competent and self-confident usually do not say, I do not have the money, that's not for me, I'm a loser, that's for winners. Another thing you can change is your financial inputs. In other words, if you have one job, you can take a second part-time job. Alternatively, you can look into building online income systems like blogging, online stores, or affiliate marketing. 
There are many fully passive or semi-passive online businesses you can get into, which don't require much startup capital. Whatever the case may be, allow yourself to be moved to action instead of simply saying to yourself that you can't afford certain things because the more you repeat these, the further down that competence hole you go. You become more and more mentally and emotionally impoverished. This then translates sooner or later into actual financial poverty. Believe me, there's nothing more lonely and disempowered than imagining yourself to be the poorest person in the crowd. That's precisely what you're doing when your financial inputs take the form of, I am too poor or I don't have money. I can't afford that. For more free educational content, visit learnforfree.biz. Content produced and distributed by AllSuperInfo.